And as the physician is performing the surgery, um, that person could be speaking out loud as they typically would if they were instructing a class who is their life. So you can take a person from anywhere in the world because of the internet and you can place them in the middle of essentially anywhere you can place one of these small 360 degree cameras. Hello there and welcome to another episode of BLP's Explore video series. We're exploring what's new, what is here today but fresh in the learning technology space and also what's coming down the pike in the future. Uh, very excited to talk with my guest today, Nick Shelton. Nick, uh, tell us about yourself. Uh, well, I'm Nick Shelton. Uh, at BLP, I'm the manager of learning interaction design. Uh, I came to BLP with a lot of background in software development. Didn't necessarily think uh, that I would be in the training world, um, but the software development background has really given me kind of uh, an ability to leverage the existing tools in our industry to push them kind of very far. So I know uh, with the background that I have that essentially anything on the internet these days is possible. Um, and so I take that knowledge and that background in software to push solutions that we create um, further than even some of the tools would say that you could push them. Um, and I serve as a, a technical partner for our clients. So sometimes they don't know what's possible within their own infrastructures and things like that. I work to partner with them to kind of determine what's possible, how far we can push things uh, while uh, staying within reason. Um, so uh, technical liaison to our clients. And then I, I manage a team of instructional uh, writers and technologists who help uh, take uh, sound instructional design from our instructional designers um, and turn it into, uh, I mean, I'm biased, but some really good training uh, for our clients. So uh, yeah. I don't know if there's too many people in training who wouldn't say that training was not something they originally expected to get into. It's a common for all of us. So yes, your journey has been a unique one. And, and I loved your description of making the tools and technologies go farther than what they uh, are listed to be able to go on their specs, so to speak. So yeah. yeah. Um, and that's kind of what you're talking about in a way in your session at XLearn. So for those of you that don't know, we've been doing this series of videos talking to different folks who are going to be speaking at our XLearn conference, which is all about excellence and workplace learning, coming up in September in Indianapolis. Uh, Nick is one of our speakers and very excited for this session. Um, Nick, your session is about 360 degree video. And um, what got you interested in 360 video to begin with? Yeah, so before I got into web development, um, I went to school and studied new media, so all things media, 3D, uh, Flash, uh, websites, video, everything. So um, back then, in order to create kind of a 360 immersive experience, you'd set up a camera, DSLR or whatever, take a bunch of photos in a bunch of diff different directions. I used to do this professionally uh, when I worked uh, for Indie Monthly and we would go photograph a location and then you would use photo editing tools, stitch these things together and then use flash with programming to create like a 360 experience. So obviously there, there was a lot of work that went into that. And even, even then it's like, well, there's going to be and or there's got to be an easier way to do this. Um, fast forward several years later and actually uh, a co-worker at BLP uh, was starting a podcast and we're like, we would like to try to do video, but we'd like to try something different. I like podcasts like this where I can look at people or whatever. We also were playing around with VR and 360 degree video internally and it was something that I was interested in. So we shot the first episode of my friend's podcast using a 360 degree camera. So I went out and I did a bunch of research and I bought one. Um, and the very first episode of their podcast uh, was shot with a 360 degree camera. Um, and then I watched the video back and my heart sunk because the quality was just nowhere near as good as it needed to be. So then out of anger and and what a frustration and uh, want for better technology and better quality, I 
played with every setting. I played with every lighting condition. I played with every compression format, uploaded to every service that allowed 360 video. I returned to that camera. I bought others. I tried others. I found one that was good enough. Um, and then we made a demo here at BLP um, and uh, had an internal VR day that our, our, all of our employees took part of, of you know, sharing what's possible. Um, so we made an interactive 360 experience. And so I've always loved shooting video and I, I love, uh, you know, I made tutorials for storyline and coding and other things before. I've always loved video and then my mind was kind of blown at the prospect of you can shoot a video that records the entire world around you. Um, so it's kind of where it started. So essentially you did all the hard work of figuring out how to efficiently and inexpensively make 360 video so that myself and everyone watching this doesn't have to, correct? Yes. Got it. That's yeah. good to know. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned VR and I'm glad you did uh, because your session talks about 360 video actually using VR headsets. Yeah. So uh, how is 360 degree video different from VR? So VR is the sliding scale. There are various levels of immersion when we talk about VR. Um, but I'll kind of keep it at a base level and that a VR is a, a completely simulated environment that you are placed into most often with a headset, which takes you out of the world that you're currently a part of um, and puts you in a completely fabricated environment. And by fabricated, I mean, imagine a video game that you've played if you've played video games or a 3D movie if you've seen Avatar or whatever. In virtual reality, most often a majority of that space that you're transported to by putting on the goggles um, is made in software using 3D modeling and purchased 3D assets and a lot of people go in behind the scenes to make Avatar. There's probably teams of hundreds of people to make that environment. Now that's a, that's a bad example. If you've ever played uh, an easy, cheesy 3D game on the internet, chances are there were a handful of people that went into it. Sir, I took 3D uh, in college a little bit um, and the amount of special specialization that is required to create a completely custom um, VR environment that you are placed into um, is extensive. VR though, in the creation of that 3D environment, you get a little bit of freedom because your head is the camera or can be the camera. So in VR space, I can move my head here and I am actually moving my head in the space. So if there was a tree in front of my face, I can move to the side and look around the tree. I can peek around it. A 360 degree of video the camera is kind of the camera. So essentially a 360 degree video in a VR, if you were wearing a headset in, a, in the context of a headset, you were at the middle of a sphere of video that wraps itself around you and your head is whatever, wherever the camera was. And so you can look around and see everything, but you cannot move side to side. So I couldn't see the other side of that tree because right here at least the tree is always there you can't move the camera i can still look around and up and down but i can't peer out so my ability to move my position in vr space is limited um, but the ability to surround yourself in an immersive environment is still possible with 360 degree video yeah and in the demo that that i've gone through that you created the one that you guys are going to have at xlearn it it still felt pretty immersive to me though because of the hotspots that you program. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so um, again, I come from a software background, so I know how the, the sausage is made behind the scenes, but there are tools these days that allow you to take a 360 degree video, which is actually just a standard video with special formatting, um, and then place hotspots on top of it. Just like you could place a hotspot on top of a video in a storyline course, you can do the same thing uh, with other technologies, other tools that allow you to kind of branch. So if you really plan well and think through your story or the training that you're trying to create, you can take a 360 degree video of an environment, add hotspots on top of, on top of it and, and create a really compelling story. Um, there are more tools today than there was when I created the first version. I am, the recommendations of tools 
that I would provide to use have changed since day one, but it's getting easier and easier um, to create those sort of immersive experiences uh, with the advances of web dev and technologies and rapid authoring tools that allow you to take a 360 video footage and make it interactive. What I find so interesting about it is that for a simple use case, um, a relatively straightforward scenario or a training situation, putting on the VR headset and having a really well thought out uh, 360 video based scenario with hotspots where I'm getting to explore the environment. It's not as immersive as moving my head around the tree, like you said, but I am exploring. It is branching. I feel like you can get a large percentage of the way there to that interactivity at really a fraction of the cost. And um, so I guess that's one of my questions is, is that the main reason why is cost and, and speed? Are those the main reasons why an organization might want to use 360 video in a VR headset versus working with somebody to make something that is true VR? Yeah. So that's, that's one of the reasons cost and speed. So, um, and just in, a more cost effective way to kind of dip your toe into the water. So I really see, um, let's, let's imagine that you are pretty sure that you want to create a 3d scenario, uh, a VR scenario, full VR. Well, you could still use 360 degree video as kind of a rapid prototype, um, to kind of mock up the story and how you're going to travel through it. Um, before you spend all the time and money, almost like a pre-visualization that you would see uh, in Hollywood or uh, using a prototyping tool like Adobe UX that you would, you would use to create software before you actually code it. Um, so you could use it as an entree uh, to VR. Um, and then I think there are also some stand, kind of standout scenarios. So imagine um, you wanted to provide somebody a firsthand experience of, I don't know, um, how a machine works in a factory or whatever. Um, and you could do a few things. You could put a 360 degree camera there and they could watch it first person, or you could spend the time to make a fully uh, immersive 3D factory, have a 3D model of the machine there, and put users there and they can walk around the machine and things like that. But like you said, you get, it's like the 80, 20 principle. You can get 80% of the way there um, for significantly less cost. And I would argue in a lot of instances because of the, how costly it is to make those immersive three, three, 3d VR environments. Like if you don't make it really well, it's not very compelling. So if the, the 3d renders models, lighting, textures, any of it is poor, well then a, a video that represents more what they would see and experience in real life may actually be a more immersive experience because the problem with a lot of VR experiences today that's still pretty new technology. And so it's very easy to be taken out of the experience because of low fidelity 3D models or performance because the people who programmed the VR experience, you know, were kind of figuring it out or whatever the case may be. Yeah, it's really interesting to me. Um, I attend a lot of industry conferences, as do you. And when I'm walking around the trade show floor, I'll see a lot of companies that will have a VR headset in their booth. And I think a lot of people will walk by that and see the headset and think that they must have uh, a VR thing to show. And it, depending on your interpretation, they do. But I think what I've, what I've found is that most of the time, it actually is 360 video with hotspots is what most people are actually doing. And they're calling it VR because it's using the headsets and it's using the, the hand pucks to, to advance mm -hmm. and do things. Mm -hmm. um, is that consistent with what you've noticed as well? Yeah, I mean, they're either full on 360 degree experience. So there, there are full, entire companies that are forming around this technology that are doing things with the NFL and other huge organizations uh, using 360 degree video um, for very large projects. Um, so it's either that or it's a VR experience just to get people to stop at the booth that isn't technically theirs or it's just something they want to show off that's fun. Um, but yeah, 360 degree video is often sold as VR. Like I, like I truly believe there are instances where I would call it VR. I, I, maybe VR light. There's people in the industry who might want to 
have a, a debate about that. Um, but you're in a you're essentially put into a virtual sphere of video. Um, so you know semantics, I guess. Yeah, I like so many things in this industry. Yeah. So. Where do you see the most learning value? Let's imagine that um, we're talking about a really, really well created uh, 360 video based scenario uh, that is being experienced through a VR headset. Where's the value in that from a learning standpoint? Yeah, so I think I think there's a few main values uh, for 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 learning, and that would be uh, placing someone in a world where it would be difficult for them to be placed otherwise. So maybe for uh, safety or regulation reasons, it would be difficult to have uh, a doctor who's in the United States uh, witness uh, a surgery performed differently in another country for whatever reason. Um, so you could place that person in the operating room and as the physician is performing the surgery, um, that person could be speaking out loud as they typically would if they were instructing a class who was there live. So you can take a person from anywhere in the world because of the internet and you can place them in the middle of essentially anywhere you can place one of these small 360 degree cameras. Like a live stream? Yeah, live streaming is coming in the future. You can do live streams, um, but they're mostly through Facebook right now, which isn't super handy for a business. No. Um, but uh, it, it'll be here. It'll be here really soon, especially as the technology picks up. Um, but but yeah, you could eventually. So imagine. I mean, this is just a pie in the sky thing. But like, you could you could put on a head VR headset and have a three hundred and sixty degree camera be your uh, participation at XLearn. We could give you a front row seat. Hmm. So one one of the cool examples. It's not three sixty video, but the NBA has NBA League Pass, and you can go sit and watch the game courtside. Uh, using oh, that's VR. cool. So it's a it's a cool use of using, or you can go to Oculus venues and sit front row at a comedy show um, in in the comedy club. But back back to learning. In addition to being able to transport someone, uh, you have a CEO who wants to tour a new factory. And I know we're not all CEOs or whatever. Or you want somebody to see the new campus. You could set up a 360 degree camera and give them a facilitated tour, and they don't have to fly in to see that. Um, so facilitated experiences, um, where it would be hard to put a person in the environment otherwise, there are a lot of examples. And then I think one of the things that I like a lot is also kind of a first person perspective, uh, in the eyes of a SME. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of hard jobs out there. Um, so imagine, and I don't want to just go to pro sports cause I like football, but, um, you could, you could you could put a 360 degree camera on Ray Lewis's helmet and he could be speaking to the camera. So in this moment, if you don't know who Ray Lewis is, he's a famous linebacker uh, in the NFL or whoever, whoever your favorite football player is, you could put another physician is doing while, while the, op, the, the uh, surgeon is performing this procedure. And so imagine heavy or expensive uh, equipment like a giant rig on a mining site or whatever it may be. Well, getting, getting, getting inside the head of some of the best people who operate this equipment could be incredibly powerful because the alternative is building, uh, you know, uh, very expensive VR environment that maybe will feel real or you can sit in a seat and kind of simulate what it would be like to operate from someone who does it every day and is, you know, sets the gold standard. So facilitated experiences and kind of living through the eyes of SMEs are kind of two big areas I think are uh, po powerful. Another more less big on the, the hard hits or the heavy equipment side, no. um, I think it's really interesting using it to experience uh, the patient's perspective. So mm -hmm. we do we do a lot of work with pharmaceutical and medical device organizations, and a lot of those organizations are looking to build empathy with their sales forces around uh, the patient experience or the patient journey. So mm -hmm. imagine putting on a headset and you're the patient for a particular treatment and you're walking in their shoes and you're, you're living, you're going through their experience and really understanding what that feels like, what that looks like. 
So I think that um, it's interesting to think about it, not just from a uh, where something might be um, physically dangerous, but also maybe it's in a very emotionally vulnerable or emotionally dangerous, you could say, situation and get really getting to experience that. Yeah, that's 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 a really solid point. Some of the best samples of 360 degree uh, video are really storytelling. And um, we all know kind of the power that story can have, you know, to impact learning. So um, definitely that would, that's a, that's a very powerful experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So obviously for organizations out there looking to use 360 degree video, um, our, our tip a little bit tongue in cheek, but of course we would really mean this would be to, to partner with us. But mm -hmm. uh, for, for somebody out there who maybe wants to do it yourself or is trying to get started with 360 video and VR headsets, um, what are some, just a couple of basic tips you would give them. Yeah, so I, I kind of identify uh, a price point for a, a starter camera, do a little research on the internet, determine kind of what, what fits your budget and a quality level. You can, go to, you can go to YouTube and see examples of quality uh, versus cost, and there's a lot of breakdowns. Um, I would say definitely come to our session. There's a lot of research that I, or my session at XLearn, um, there's a lot of uh, research that I broke down. I will say some of the rapid authoring tools uh, providers give a pretty good overview. I would say Trivantis is, uh, has some articles that's pretty good. That's a good starting place. But there's a lot of things that don't really get called out um, and that you kind of have to learn through trial and error, such as how do you record audio the best? How do you ensure that you don't have people in your shot that you don't want in your shot? Um, how does this technology even work? And so really you can, you can dig pretty deep and still not uncover all of the pain points. Um, so if you can come to the session, um, I'll get into a lot of that stuff, make some camera recommendations, um, and, you know, entry level, high level. Uh, if you're just getting started and, and only have a few quarters in your pocket recommendations. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, just do a Google search, go to YouTube, see some comparisons and um, play. I say in terms of video software, Adobe stuff's the best. There are uh, some open source video editors. Like I, I believe you can get a version of Filmora. Uh, for free that allow you to do 360 degree videos and or you could always get a trial of uh, Captivate, which allows you to do some 360 video stuff or uh, Trivantis' Scenario VR, which also allows you to kind of play around an interactive 360 degree video. If you do not have a video editor, a lot of these cameras these days will allow you to take footage from the camera and then put it directly in the software or if not, they provide you a tool that allows you to basically click a button. So the, the, the 360 video is ready for uh, prime time in, in the tools. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. And Nick's session is uh, at the XLearn conference uh, happening. The main conference is September 5th in Indianapolis. Uh, and there's a pre-conference workshop on design thinking on September 4th. Uh, registration is open for both of those at the time of this filming. Uh, so Nick, thank you. I've got five quick questions for you uh, to wrap up. My first question is uh, just rapid fire. Uh, give us a favorite blog or website that you like to, to keep up with in your field. So my favorite blog is Engadget. That's probably where I go most consistently or Wired. I actually have a physical subscription to Wired still so I can read it on a plane or wherever and then um, also access their web content. For the industry, uh, I, I do like some more, pop like David Kelly's blog's pretty good. He gets, uh, I, I like how he gets in depth uh, with technology, but he also calls it like, like he sees it, um, which is kind of impressive based on the position that he's in in the industry. Um, so, you know, those are the two. I mainly tech blocks. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. Uh, what's an app on your phone that you're, that you can't live without? I, I feel like I'm going to sound like a teenager, but uh, YouTube premium. Uh, and the reason is like, I am a serial learner. So if I were to be honest about blogs, I have more subscriptions to learning websites than I, than like I spend more time, like trying to learn things on Linda or LinkedIn learning now or plural site or whatever it may be as much time as reading blogs. Um, so YouTube premium, because most podcasts these days have video components. I can with premium download those. Uh, I can create my own content. You can go live to the world in no time. Haven't done that yet. I'm, uh, you know, not there. But literally anything, like, hey, hey, this is a, a problem we talk about a lot when you hear about people talking about LMS. It's just like, well, where do you go when you want to learn something? 
and people's like, well, you could just go to Google most of the time. Well, YouTube is kind of like that in a video format. Um, but the, the perk is, and I love this, is I can download a, a one hour uh, conference session from you know JavaScript China or Asia or whatever, download it, be watching part of it, turn my phone off and now it becomes an audio podcast in my pocket, take it back out and watch it as video uh, uninterrupted. Um, yeah, they're gonna give Netflix a run for their money eventually. There you have it, folks. If you want to be great at technology like Nick, you got to be a constant learner and you never you need to never stop learning. And I think that's true for all of us, really. But um, Nick, uh, another thing people might not know about you, I know you're working on your MBA. Um, you've been in the business world now for quite a while. Uh, what's a lesson you have learned in business that has been particularly valuable uh, for you? Yeah, I guess it would. It would probably be in its, it, we, we use this thing at Bottom Line Performance called the uh, um, uh, entrepreneurial, ent I always struggle with that, entrepreneurial operating system. And so um, we kind of use that to ensure that everything we do here is uh, high functioning. Um, and so one of the things that they talk about is having the right people in the right seats. And so um, it, you could all probably relate to this where you do the thing that makes your heart sing on a specific day and you're, you're, you're walking on sunshine or, or whatever it may be. If you know Spider-Man 3, you're doing whatever dance Peter Parker was doing mm -hmm. uh, in that movie. And so even on a project level, like ensuring you have the right people in the right seat on the project and or you're helping those people find the right seat. So if it's a SME, you know, they're happy about the seat they're sitting in on the project for their role because they're in every project team, both on our team and then the teams that we work with, you know, we try to become partners and cohesive teams. And the best projects I've ever worked on is when those teams melded together and everyone in every seat on the project just felt like they were adding a lot of value. Um, and so when you can get to that level of partnership and everybody feeling uh, their addition to the thing that you guys are creating uh, in unison together, you can create more with less, go faster and further and accomplish more uh, than, than you could even imagine. And then at the end of the day, it's fulfilling and, and you can do that uh, Spider-Man 3, this is Spider-Man 3, Peter Parker walk through New York where he's dancing hysterically and you feel great, like you're energized, like you can go longer than you thought you could and you want to. Um, because you've found that synergy. Yeah. So I imagine our clients wouldn't want us to give too many details here, uh, but at a high level, what is a current or upcoming project uh, that you're particularly excited about in just a few words? Uh, yeah, we have a potential to partner with one of our great clients on a software development uh, project of a training portal. Um, and it would be great to work with them. We've had a lot of great meetings, fun, energizing. The same, the thing that I'm talking about, uh, where you get done with the meeting and you're kind of buzzing because you're excited about the thing you're going to make together. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the possibility of uh, doing that. Awesome. And my final question, because I'm sure at least one person was wondering, walk us through the assortment of funny stuff that is in the shot behind you, because there's some funny uh, things up there that I think are worth pointing out. Well, I mean, we're in Indiana, so it's, uh, well, actually, can I, yeah. We're in Indiana, so I have a nice photo of a beach. Uh, Not just any photo. That The stuff behind you is vintage bottom line performance advertisements from the 90s, I believe. I was going to uh, say, I was in the early 2000s. I was surprised that you were having me show off. I was like, that, that's not the current font. No, it's, <laughs> yeah, I'm sharing it because it's funny. And I think we have a computer yeah. going through a backup. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it's just a funny assortment. Over there in the uh, corner. Yeah, yeah uh, the, the knowledge gurus over the there. Gurus, so, yeah. you know, what we set up where there's space available, but I, I just thought it'd be funny to give people a little tour of that. This is now the P room. It used to be called the pub room because we had a nice tall pub table and, uh, you know, we still kept the P, but uh, we, it's the P room because our rooms are BLP, bottom line performance. Yes. So clarification there. So there you have it. Uh, you got a little bonus look behind <laughs> the scenes at the BLP office. So thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. My name's Steve Bowler. Uh, I have been the host of these videos and I know we'll be back with more. Hope to see you at the XLearn conference, September 4th and 5th in Indianapolis. And Nick, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights with us. 
Yeah, thank you. I'm excited to see and meet some of you at the conference. Great. Thanks, everybody.